I'm James Kendall, music journalist. I went to my first free party in about 1992. I DJed at some free parties. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's a really meaningful film for me. And uh, yeah, Alessandro, do you want to introduce yourself? My name is Alessandro. I made this film because I come from both free party and the festival culture. And uh, I've seen so many different uh, documentaries about these words, but they were all kind of stereotyped and just focusing on the usual, you know, drug abuse, uh, uh, very loud music, uh, the fact that we're taking on illegal places, but none of them really went in depth, focusing on the fact that thousands of people every week decided to go to a free party, making this underground culture the, the longest ever. I mean, it's been going on for 35 years. So why is this still happening? Why is this not dying? So I decided to, to make um, a film uh, giving complete freedom to all those who started the movement and uh, are, have been carrying on the movement uh, and, uh, you know, are part of the underground culture. Great, yeah. I, I think it, it could only have been made by somebody that was inside the culture. It, fi it feels like a film that was made from the dance floor, really. There are a few, uh, let's say, reportages made by Vice. I mean, I love Vice, but you could see that they were just, you know, paid reportages by someone who have never been, probably not even to a club. Yeah, so it's, so. I mean, that's something, let's just uh, cover that quickly. It's, it's almost impossible to tell a 30-year story in, in 79 minutes. So what were you, what were the, key bits that you definitely wanted to say with this film and what were the things that just cu just couldn't make it in the time frame what i wanted to do is to understand why uh many party goers were really keen on the fact that some djs uh, who were part of the free party movements could not play in uh, clubs and festivals otherwise they would be considered you know sell out so I myself, once I went to see Spiral Tribes in uh, St. for Shoreditch and I had to spend 30 pounds. And in my head, I was, oh, this guy, you know, they kind of started the free party movement. So why do I now have to pay 30 pounds? But, you know, then I started to, you know, to have a thought to say, hey, you know, they're now professionals and they need to make a living. So it is more than fair that they are being paid as um, professionals, musicians. By I realized that still many, many free party goers could not understand this. So I say, you know, I, I want to focus the film on, uh, you know, on this beat. All that. And, and there's also like a, one of your interventions was very useful when you say, you know, even though if we play in a festivals, you know, we're still under, underground as fuck. I uh, was well, so on Ed Cox and um, I'm a team day producer, musician, um, and also uh, he used to put on raves back in the year 2000 to about 2010. And then uh, I was sort of, uh, well, moved to Bristol and um, it, I was on campus doing them raves and then moved to Bristol and was involved in other sound systems there and then become a sort of professional musician as well. So but I've always like respected the fact that I've come from the free party scene still doing play um, at free parties now and again. Um, but yeah, like, basically it's no different really because from like free party sound systems um, doing a hire out at clubs, you know, like nobody says anything. I will, you know, they're getting paid a couple of hundred quid to hire their rig out to a, a club, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to eat and things at the end of the day, you know, so. But yeah, I, I do understand on both sides, you know, people want to keep it you know, you've got to be, you know, only at raves or whatever, but as everyone, everyone sort of, you know, their opinion, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah. You want to be free up to the points, like, to the living, like, you know, I've gone, you know, the out of the building. Yeah, but it's staying to the point. Yeah. And like, you know, people have to eat. Yeah. Exactly. That, exactly. That, that's exactly the point that I tried to, um, to transmit, the message I wanted to give. Yeah, but, yeah, that's a good message. I hope you got it. Enhanced. I've got a question, right? So I, I've been raving since 88, and I've got two sons now. I need swirls when they have hair. It's like right in the beginning. And it's, I think it's something about youth culture. Because at that point, 
they, you know, everyone was young and it was, was more political, yeah? But as people get older, then they have family, they also want to make money. And let's be true, people made a lot of money in a free party through the drug scene as well. So that's something they must shouldn't really be saying on the recording. But that's also what happened. So I think there's kind of our aspects to look at, look at. So how, you know, it was young, people couldn't do stuff for free. As they get older and have families, they want to monetize. That's the reality. Also, within the free party scene, you know, certain South sisters did make money from the job scene, yeah? And that is a reality. Yeah. But also on a positive note, right in lockdown, Senate, which is a few miles from here, 2,000 young people put a sound system on, kamikaze, and got away with it for two days. So there is still things happening, but I think it maybe takes some political unrest like it was in the 80s, the late 80s, and it was quite tough in the 80s, yeah? And that's when this kind of steam born. So maybe we're going to see Sunday. Yeah. I don't know. Well, then, with I just, I mean, I percent agree with you. Have we got fucking nicked? And <laughs> see, if there were any nice into being there at this party that you said about the yeah. standing one, yeah. every got fucking nicked because I'm during COVID. All right, so it was during COVID. 80 people got arrested. They, uh, sorry, I'm not shouting. I just got angry, actually, about this. 80 people, four of them were made to lie, other people in the country, I was in Ireland, there's a little man. Like, fuck to that. <laughs> but, like, and, and all the six organisers were all over the papers here, and it was a big news. Yeah, there was a big one in Bristol, and, like, uh, uh, one of the DJs got fined £20,000. And they did just be that. In, uh, in Italy, so, um, a few months ago, the, a very far, uh, right-wing political party um, you know, came on power, and basically what's happened in England, in the UK in 1994, has been happening now in Italy. So um, free party organizers can face up to uh, five years in prisons, and that's guys, I mean, it's five fucking years in prison. Tories, but, uh, and he's so what happening, whatever fuck was... So, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, we're, we're not as far. It's always been a super, super challenging world to be in, and um, I think we, your film showed some of the um, sacrifices that people make, not, not just financially, but also in terms of uh, their futures and in terms of, um, of what they're able to kind of give themselves in later life. But do you, do you, having lived in that world now quite intensely for quite a long time, do you feel positive about the future of the party scene and the future of the people that are in that film well i i'm gonna repeat something that's been uh, uh said by uh one of the guys i interviewed so uh the free party movement is a cyclical meaning that there have been uh, some moments where you know it was a bit lower so not as many party goers it was uh, excessively uh, repressed by police while in some other moments it, it completely boomed. Perhaps now in Italy, it's, I don't want to say it's dying, but it's definitely slowing down. While in France, it's booming again. So I think that uh, each country, uh, all over Euro Europe has different moments where you know, it goes up and down. I don't think that the free party movement will ever die. Uh, it will keep evolving. Uh, uh, it will keep adapting to, you know, to the new society, to the new culture, and like how we adapt every day with, you know, what, what happens in our lives. Uh, you know, same does uh, uh, the free party movement. So I think he will always uh, better carry on, just in different ways. Um, it seems, um, well, it, it's, it's always been a very political movement. Um, and it's tied so tightly into politics, like the uh, the woman at the back was was saying, and this guy was talking about, uh, yeah, there's the fuck the, the toys, stickers, uh, and those exist because politics plays a huge part in the free party scene. Um, is bad politics good for partying? Uh, <laughs> I guess he choose to make good parties. <laughs> Uh, like, as I was saying, in Italy now there's a uh, lot of repressions and uh, I understand that uh, some systems taking a break because one thing is, hey, I'm going to spend one night, you know, in the police station, uh, 
find a few thousands of pounds to get my equipment back. Another thing is I'm going to spend the next five years of my life in a fucking prison. There's quite a difference. As Ryan uh, from Total Resistance used to say, you know, like, whilst it was understood that the riot team protesting, going to a free party, you know, was rebellious, like going against society. Uh, it was a movement, while uh, nowadays, uh, uh, I don't want to blame media and the social media, but, you know, it might have become more of a trend. Like, I'm going there just for a reason. It's because, you know, again, I can party two days or two weeks doing what the fuck you want. So it's more difficult nowadays in 2023 finding political reasons. So I totally understand, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know your name, but lady in the back, uh, uh, what he said. I 100% agree. I mean, it was, it was much more political while nowadays became more of a, I'm going to the party. Escape is it. Uh, which again, I, I, I don't want to blame uh, kids who go to a free party just because they want a fucking party. I mean, I myself, when I was 17, and many other times say, hey, I want a party for three days in a row. <laughs> I'm going to a free party. I'm not going to a club. We cannot blame how, you know, the new generations evolved. While, uh, you know, we, like, I think I, you know, I'm 35, so I live the middle generation. I was not there in the 90s. I'm not, I'm now not partying every weekend anymore. So. I was partying in the 2000s, from 2005 to 2020, something like that. And, uh, you know, like, we can give uh, positive inputs to the new generations. So I think that's what we, we need to do, that the older generation need to do with the uh, newer generations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite a complicated story, and people have a very deep ownership of it and a very strong opinion and uh, we could hear we well, could hear that in the audience as various interviewees said something and people would disagree and we've we've had some quite feisty reactions since um was it difficult to go into that world and have people trust you so it might be interesting to hear from ed actually like what was it about this guy that you trusted him to tell this story. To be fair, it was day three at a festival. <laughs> it was kind of nice to be asked about that whole thing because, and, and, and knowing that it was, you know, another documentary, like, because there it was, it was another one that was that World Traveler series, you know, one where they all go. Yes. Um, yeah. one, one crew goes to Croatia, I think Desert Storm, and, and, yeah. and, and there were, other than that, and then another one about Exodus and stuff, I, Hadn't seen many, and and yeah, it was kind of nice to think, oh, maybe I can have an opinion, like, have my opinion voiced in a, you know, in a, in a documentary about it, really, and know it. Some of the other people that were involved yeah. as well, and um, so if if he's got them on board, then he tries to, yeah, yeah. Um, and then quickly just go back to you know the whole thing about um, focusing on like people doing drugs and all this other thing. It's like back in the day when they, people were just drinking and then, you know, and people start smoking pot. It's, there's sort of these phases of what people choose to take, you know, and drugs are different now and, and the music's different now. So things are just going to change, you know, and like, you know, it, at points it has become a bit gangster nowadays. Like, you know, you've got the laughing gas, guy and, and then there'll be a big fight and and back in the day a lot of people would sort of split up the fight but nowadays it's like oh is he kind of in a knife or you know and you can sort of be like oh it's gone worse but has society got worse and it's just evolving with it and you know this is you know i don't know it's a it's a tricky one to be like oh no, this isn't how it should be or this wasn't how it used to be you know and like we, we try, when we go to raves nowadays, we, you know, if, if the place is a shithole, we like, right, pick bags out. This is what we used to do. We used to pick up all the rubbish as we went, you know, like, so the police would, the police would be less like in a rush to get rid of you if they see you picking things up, you know. And, you know, it's it's about uh, passing on that, um, the marriage and the, the wisdom from the fail, you know, and try and uh, inspire rather than point fingers and say, 
you know, it's all changed and it's not right and it never used to be like this, if you know what I mean. With what? So the evolution of change continually within a sea. Otherwise, if I'm going to be it just look. I think we certainly needs to keep changing and each group up to it, plus their own gust to it, now their own parameters. And then, yeah, there's been eras where the sea was very well self-deletes. And then there's the era when he has total freedom and chaos, and he does keep changing. And Pete and Shoot, and he'd be involved in it, shouldn't be going, oh, my bit was really, really great, and that bit shit. <laughs> but Pete can do that. Yeah. Mid like in general, you can say, oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just, um, we're going to throw it open to questions. So it's kind of, it's been, it's been pretty open already, but uh, we're going to go fully to you guys in a second. I just wanted to hear a bit more about, Alessandra, how you got people to trust you in such a tightly guarded scene. So I was, Ed was saying, there, there weren't many uh, documentaries, uh, real documentaries about the scene uh, uh, that would, would bring, you know, truth and reality of how, you know, we who are part of the scene live it. Most of them, you know, were just maybe BBC reportage, uh, Vice uh, videos. And they were, again, they're just so focusing on the stereotypes of drug, loud music, hey, you're on a someone else's property. My way of approaching was explaining that I was doing something from for the underground community, coming from the underground community myself. And uh, I wouldn't ask anything personal. And uh, so I was making them understand that I was, you know, one of them and not a, a reporter. I'm not a, I'm not a reporter. I'm just someone who's part of the community who, you know, who decides to document just to break all these stereotypes that, you know, people see. I always like to say, I did this documentary for my mom, meaning for someone who doesn't know anything about the scene, you know. If you ask my mom, oh, what about free party? Say, oh, you know, don't go to free party. People die, people are violent, criminals, because why? Uh, you know, she watches, you know, she watches main uh, media deals and that's what, you know, they pass to mainstream uh, audience. Uh, so I think that that's the way why, why, you know, people started to trust me. And then again, as he said, you know, I was saying, you know, I've got a Chris Liberator on board that, oh, well, if Chris agreed, and then, you know, he became, um, uh, you know, like a small a snowball. Yeah, exactly. The project started and, uh, you know, uh, to be slightly this morning, uh, maybe, you know, just a couple of people interviews. And again, literally like snowball <laughs> effect, it's, it's the right thing. So I started to uh, interview more and more people and eventually had over 30 hours of footage and it's been absolutely difficult, you know, to, to select, you know, just 79 minutes within 35 hours. So uh, it took years, literally years. Again, also because it was a, almost a woman band. Bye guys, thank you for coming. Mate, thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a quick right field question, which I was waiting to try. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Fine. Go for it. Uh, what began to occur to me through watching that, I, I loved it so much. Um, which was kind of subconscious, but I never really formalised it, but we came out about how much chaos magic had underpinned the whole scene. I mean, maybe it's come out and I missed it. I don't think I missed it, but do you know? Chaos magic says it's already been believed. Has it been still scared? I don't know, it's only another, another quantum reality. Oh, well, that is the film that I would like to see, how, you know, it wasn't just about music, it was about magic. By yeah. chaos and magic. My approach towards this film was from a kind of musical and a social point of view, yeah. but you know, like something uh, more visual than coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The aesthetic, uh, I have the kind of temp uh, Genesis or Asia, they call that kind of um, template of the psychic give aesthetic, who kind of, you know, underpin the, the kind of whole look, right? You're worried. So, uh, Zambelli was the bald guy, the Italian uh, bald guy. Um, so he, yeah, so he made a film, um, called, uh, uh, Techno, the breath of the monster. Really? Check it out. I should, I mean, it's in Italian. I'm not a hundred percent sure it's got English subtitles. I've got an auntie who speaks, but you may, <laughs> you, you can find it on YouTube and, uh, it kind of gives, maybe it's not exactly what you're looking for, but it, it kind of 
speaks more about the art itself and it's more about traveling and leaving leaving the, the actual uh, rave, the, the, leaving where the free party life. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm in Chedra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, I think that's kind of what we, you know, why it behangs as it does. You know, because it's chaos and it and the experiment kind of you know it's got new things to show. Yeah. I mean, you know, as the fella as the fella said earlier, I mean, there would be like a, a thousand of these documentaries that uh, will need to be done to cover everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I realize, you know, your, your interest is the music, but you know, that's that's why. Right, right. uh, let's go. Well, rock and roll, Dad. Thank you. So Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good question on the way out. Thank you. Um, anyone else got another qu uh, got another question? Okay, at the back. And I was wondering, is there a kind of movement to make the pre-party scene more accessible? Because I love the like idea of a pre-party and the by the coolest of that, um, but can it like truly be a free party when it's not it, like not everyone can be free in it? Like, say, the marginalized people, disabled people, the like some the locations and stuff when you access to looking to see with people. Uh, the only problem of that is the uh, is the legality of it. Yeah. Uh, so generally, what happens nowadays is uh, you, I'm oh, sorry, nowadays uh, you get your number on on the network kind of thing. I mean, you'll get sent, um, you know, this party will be going on in London or Bristol. These sound systems are involved. It's kind of like, a, almost like a mailing list or word of mouth between, you know, it's just, just so that people, um, you know, it's people that know people. Because the thing is, if everyone knows about it, A, it's, you know, more likely to get busted. B, more likely to have trouble from people that aren't ravers that don't understand the scene, if you know what I mean. But yeah. in quite a few occasions, I've seen uh, people on the wheelchair mm -hmm. and uh, they actually did crowd surfing. <laughs> um, so I, un I understand that, uh, you know, like, especially nowadays, we want to include as many realities as possible uh, within the raving underground community. Uh, in terms of, like you said, like someone on a wheelchair, I've seen them. Of course, if it's on the top of a hill or on a mountain, uh, no, it, it's 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 more difficult. But like, like, yeah, like but especially in London, where more houses, you know, are very much accessible. I, I've seen quite many people on wheelchairs. What I love the of the free party community, and uh, no one gives a shit of who you are, black, yellow, blue. Any sexual orientation, they the more the better. If they were in the wheels, yeah, you can't get up the stairs. Be, it, everyone will be like, well, I'm absolutely, I'm exactly. It's not like uh, you know, every person for themselves. So, is there the same kind of thing? Well, like, it's very apparent that there's a big risk of like peace presence and book is seen in our society of certain groups and treat it for us either peace. Is the that kind of move that we're in the sea to kind of protect so to speak for for the kind of deal with that? Yeah. So so could you, if you were um, someone that was um, at danger of being mistreated by the police or the authorities, would you be like left on your own to fight for yourself? We've got people that are good speaking to the police, like know the laws, know everything. Say if there's like, so let's say for example some some black kids or some kids that are like, you know, from from the sort of ghetto and stuff, they'll probably more likely stay away. If they were getting picked on, people would all stand in. Be like, no, look, you know, why are you discriminating against them and, you know, have a point. The, the only thing that kind of goes to the way if everyone's too off their heads and they can't, you know, and then uh, it's not, not like as as unity as, as it should be, but other than that, you generally got people that are good with speaking to the police, know their laws, can read off a load of legal stuff. They're like, we can't really do much about that, you know. And so everyone does stick together. Like in a good party environment, I can't speak for every single party. Not every sound system have got the same, you know, ethos. But the ones I have been involved in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go down like that, generally. Yeah, I think like traditionally, it's been 
very safe for women, very safe for, um, for different sexualities and, and races, um, everyone mixing together and everyone looking after each other, a real sense of community. What was the most challenging part of making the film? I was absolutely uh, shrinking 35 hours of interviews into 79 minutes. Uh, I had so many extremely interesting uh, topics. Uh, you know, I wanted to include, I remember the first cut I did was four hours and a half. And it initially, you know, we had the idea of, uh, you know, doing a sort of like three parts documentary, but again, being independent, so basically with literally no budget, and it was really difficult to cover with B-roll, you know, like what you see, archive footage, everything, you know, was given by some filmmakers and all the other brand community, but it's already been really difficult to, to create a 79 minutes documentary, so it would have been impossible to, to do it longer. So yeah, that was definitely the most challenging uh, part of the, of the whole process. Um, it was really, really nice to see s some new footage of club culture um, because it's so, we see the same stuff so often because there's so little of it. Uh, so it's really nice to see some more come into the filmmaking process. Thank you very much for coming everyone and thank you Alessandro for making the film and Ed for being a great part of the documentary and, uh, and everyone that's ever been to a free party. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.